Dr. Tom Mihaljevich has made a career of getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. He has performed nearly 3,000 heart surgeries and is a pioneer in robotic-assisted surgery. He helped build and lead the Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi and has been the Cleveland Clinic's president and CEO since 2017. Mihaljevich oversees more than 14 million patient visits a year and over $13 billion in operating revenue. Dr. Lisa Yerian is a gastrointestinal pathologist by training, but in 2019, Dr. Mihaljevich asked her to become the hospital system's first chief improvement officer. Under her leadership, the Cleveland Clinic Improvement Model was developed and launched. The model includes the pillars of organizational alignment, visual management, problem solving, and standardization, written in plain language to engage every caregiver in improvement every day. Together, Dr. Mihaljevich and Dr. Yarian are working with their 80,000 caregivers to build lean systems and behaviors through visual management, tiered daily huddles, and robust problem-solving methods. Their team is focused on creating a culture of continuous improvement that will benefit patients and employees alike and realize their vision of Cleveland Clinic as the best place to receive care anywhere and the best place to work in healthcare. Please welcome Dr. Tom Mihaljevich, Dr. Lisa Yarian, and this session's moderator and GE Healthcare President and CEO, Pete Arduini. Welcome. Do you want to set up this slide? There? Yes. Great. Well, thank you guys for, for joining us. And uh, obviously the session we have is getting comfortable with uncomfortable problems. And uh, I can only imagine as they well, obviously switch to the health care discussions, what you've both experienced. But maybe for a question for both of you to start off here is give us some of the, you know, feel for some of the, the challenging problems that you've dealt with with the leadership team recently or, or back in the COVID window time. Yeah. There, there are so many problems that we're dealing with on a daily basis, just given the nature of our work. You know, we provide care in more than 275 locations 24 7 for millions of people. Uh, all of them are coming with hopes that we'll be able to reduce their suffering and, fi and find a cure. So there is no shortage of challenges, but probably one of the uh, that I would like to highlight that occurred relatively recently was a challenge for our organization in detecting patients early on who have bloodstream infection. We call the term is sepsis. Uh, bloodstream infection can kill a person very, very quickly. The problem is that the presenting signs, the presenting symptoms are often very subtle. However, if there is any delay in diagnosis, literally, if it's a delay in a few hours, that can mean a difference between a life and death. And that's something that we engaged with as, uh, as a team. Yeah, so when we face a tough problem like sepsis, an uncomfortable problem, not saving as many lives as we believe we could or should, we use lean tools to really break down that problem into its parts and focus on the process that's failing rather than the people. And for sepsis, our team's used an A3. It's a lean tool to really get to the root cause and change that process to make sure we're detecting the infection earlier and getting the antibiotics to the patients much, much more quickly. And as a result of that work over the last year, our team has saved over 500 additional lives. In healthcare, really, there are no easy problems left. They're all tough and they're all uncomfortable. And what we found with the lean methods is they give our caregivers really the courage and the confidence to be willing to talk about them and face them because they know they're going to be able to solve them. And, and that's really helped us tremendously with sepsis and, and a variety of other yeah. very uncomfortable problems. So thanks for sharing that example. And obviously it is, it's such a big challenge for around the world, that topic. Lisa, I'm kind of curious, your title's Chief Improvement Officer. It's a great title, by the way. Thank you. Um, and you started out your career in, in what we would normally think of more traditional way of taking care of patients and that attribute in different focus areas. But you, you moved into this area. I'm kind of curious, could you maybe share your journey 
And then how did you begin fundamentally your lean journey uh, as, a, as a clinician and, and thinking more broadly about health systems? Good question. Uh, Tom gets credit for the title, but I do like it. Uh, I think like many people, I became a doctor because I wanted to make a difference. I grew up in rural southeastern Ohio, and healthcare was a luxury that many families, including my own, didn't always have. I graduated from a small school, and a few days after we graduated, one of us, Jamie, died of complications of a procedure that I now know he never should have had. And a few weeks later, the doctor who did it called Jamie's parents to apologize. He said he couldn't live with himself for hiding the error. I wanted to change that. So I became a doctor, and I came to the Cleveland Clinic to practice. And I very quickly got pulled into problems in the laboratory, process problems. And there I found other people using lean to solve process problems. And I was struck. I loved it, all of it. As a doctor, I can only help maybe 40 or 50 people a day, but with Lean, I saw the opportunity to help thousands, maybe even millions, because we could make things better for the patients at the same time, elevating and respecting and empowering the worker. And the worker was who I identified with. The worker was who the people I grew up with and the people I loved were. And so suddenly, I could do both things with one philosophy, and I couldn't, I couldn't look away from that. And I realized that if we could actually learn and share with others like we're able to do today, thank you, Larry, we could really change the world. And I was just incredibly fortunate to be in an organization like the Cleveland Clinic where I have leaders like Tom who really give me the opportunity to still practice medicine, I still sign out one day a week, and be a part of this at work. That's great. And, and maybe Tom, switching to you, obviously is leading one of the larger healthcare systems, not just the US, but obviously a global footprint. How do you think about continuous improvement? Obviously, this isn't new to be in healthcare to try to get better, but how did the lean journey come about? And, and how do you think about it in the sector, but also within the, within the clinic? Well, the, the, the lean journey has been a part, the integral part of Cleveland Clinic's history now, a little over 100 years. From the very beginning, actually before these terms lean were even known, uh, we spoke a lot about the culture and the tools in order to make the organization better, to create an improvement that we would like to do at a larger scale. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the tools is Gemba. We spoke a little bit about Dara's experiences, gym experiences, and so on. For us at the Cleveland Clinic, Gemba has been an integral part of uh, our culture from the very beginning. Uh, we have more than 6,500 physicians, each of them practice still, regardless of their managerial position. So there is an expectation that all of our leaders will continue to do the work uh, that their teams are doing themselves every day. So that really never really separates the management of the organization from, from the frontline, people who really care, care for patients. And uh, the other thing about the, about the culture, it's really important, it's kind of impossible to lead, lead the organization without really having what you call a street credibility. Uh, you have to really prove to your colleagues that you're really, really good at that core job before you can really ascend to, to lead the people. Um, dictum doesn't work. Uh, influencing outcomes uh, works very much. So, and the other thing is for us as an organization, I would say, the third tenant of our lean is transparency, transparency with outcomes. Uh, people will not know uh, what needs to get done unless we're really familiar with the data. So Cleveland Clinic really led the wave uh, in the world for transparency of healthcare outcomes. We're the first organization ever that voluntarily published patient outcomes before it became a worldwide requirement. So uh, that is the way that we're not just trying to influence the work that we do, but the, trying to influence the work that is being done in healthcare more broadly. Has the journey in transparency helped the lean journey as well of getting to oh. ground truth and talking about the real issues? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The transparency is a, is a core tenant. We cannot expect people to get better if they do not know how they're performing today and what is expected of them tomorrow. 
And uh, uh, that transparency includes, obviously, transparency in all aspects, not just in measuring a success, but uh, truly be comfortable with uncomfortable and being really, really comfortable speaking about failure. I will tell you one personal story that really formed, uh, uh, cemented my decision about Cleveland Clinic being an exceptional place to, to receive care. I was a heart surgeon for pretty much most of my career. So I joined a Cleveland Clinic coming from Boston. And uh, uh, within a two or three, two or three days uh, of my arrival, a chair of our department, at the time the most prominent cardiac surgeon in Oklahoma, walks into the morning meeting at 7 o'clock uh, in white scrubs, sprayed with blood from head to toe. He was in his late 60s. And he comes into this room surrounded by the, all of the people who report to him, including the students and the residents, and just collapses in a chair early in the morning because he was operating all night trying to save the life of a person who was gravely, gravely ill. And he said, and I'll never forget that, he said, you know, today I struggled. Today I didn't know what to do. And I thought I knew how to do this job really, really well. And what that did, that acknowledgement, that vulnerability, uh, instilled in all of us a comfort, not only a comfort, but also a requirement implicit requirement for us to be honest and transparent about our failures so that it, through that vulnerability and through that transparency, we collectively get better. Uh, nothing more important than that. Leading with an example, doing a job that everybody else does, staying up all night despite the fact that you're on the top of your game and you certainly could have decided not to take call at Sunday night but uh, he showed up that Monday morning and he was humble and he was transparent. Thanks for sharing that, that story. And in a similar vein, Lisa, I mean, you know, all of us here in the room have experienced COVID, but if you weren't a healthcare provider, you obviously didn't, you experienced it in a very different way. And I know you've spoken about lean and the toolkits and how you've thought about that and how it's helped you through COVID, maybe you could share what are some of the elements of the system you had in place and, and honestly, how you had to adapt this system during COVID and what it, what it really did for you. Yeah, so our system has four pieces of the playbook. As Patty described their system earlier, uh, organizational alignment, really clear focus on what matters most, visual management, transparency, but actually knowing how are we doing today in real time so that we can actually understand what the barriers were and do problem solving and understand root cause around that. We found that if you find, if you find data around how you were performing a month ago, you don't remember why you succeeded or why you failed. Problem solving and then standardization. So during COVID, what matters most didn't change for us at all. We still wanted to be the best place to receive care anywhere and the best place to work in healthcare. But now we had a whole new set of challenges in front of us in order to do that, in order to keep our patients safe, in order to keep our caregivers safe. So we had systems in place like our tiered daily huddles where we talk about every day, how are we doing today? And we adapted that very quickly to make sure that we were talking about the problems of COVID, that we understood what new problems our caregivers were facing because everything was changing very rapidly. We were learning every day new things about the problems, new things about the virus, and new things about how other people were solving problems. So we adapted that system to make sure all that COVID information was coming through the organization, and we were able to also share new information around COVID and how we wanted the teams to adapt and make sure that they were safe and they kept everybody safe. And then the third piece was problem solving, and that's probably the one that um, is most notable to speak of, uh, we now had these massive problems that we didn't know how to solve and a very short time frame to solve them. Uh, one great example is we needed to create a way to test all these people who were very scared that they had COVID while we kept them and our patients safe. So we developed a drive-through testing center. We stood it up within four days and within three days, the next three, we quadrupled the number of patients we could serve an hour. Over the course of the year, we tested over 300,000 patients in that parking garage. 
outside, and we created standard work so we could share it with other locations across our system and with other healthcare providers. So that capability that was in place in the organization really became an enormous lever for us to respond quickly to this whole new set of problems we faced in, again, delivering on what mattered most. No, and that's fantastic, and, and I can only imagine the amount of, it's not in the standard playbook, how do you get the right folks together and how do you think common? We heard a lot of discussions of A3 or plan to check, uh, analyze, a lot of different things that are going out. I'm kind of curious, maybe Tom, for you, what's the approach at the clinic? And you know, for all of us, there's the challenges of everybody wants to do it slightly differently. How, how do you think about a the Cleveland Clinic way of problem solving versus a distributed way, but maybe tell us a little bit about what the secret sauce is in your approach. <laughs> well, secret sauce is obviously spoke a little bit about the culture through the example that I shared with all of you, but then there is uh, the other part of our secret sauce about uh, really getting better every day is the way that we go about our day-to-day -day business. I uh, got this job about six years ago, and uh, as all of us, you know, Whatever we do is a reflection of our past experiences. I used to be a heart surgeon before I took this job. And as a heart surgeon, you know what's going on in the operating room every single second. And you're really paying a close attention to it. That's the secret to success. And then as a CEO, I would come and people would come to me and give me a monthly review of our operations or quarterly report, which was informative but I didn't know what to do with it because whatever happened already happened in the past quarter. So for me, it was like a, I'm a basketball fan. So you see, it's like a playing basketball game and uh, you know, the scoreboard would light up only once. And that would be at the end of the, at the, end of the quarter or at the end of the uh, halftime. So what am I gonna do now? So the, we said, okay, so how can we learn what is 80,000 people strong organization doing every single day on a daily basis so that we can help each other get better every single day. So we devised what we call a tier daily huddles. It is a very structured approach when each of our operating teams, a total of 20, 25,000 people every single day at every level of the organization in a structured manner talk about what matters to us most, quality, safety, patient experience, number of patients served, environment of care. With that, they solve most of those issues right there and then. What they cannot solve, they report up. And at the sixth level, which is our executive level, at 11 o'clock, zero, zero, precisely 11 o'clock a.m. every morning at Cleveland Clinic, our executive team gets together, and we know exactly, we could tell you probably if I were to take my phone out, how many patients have we seen, down to a single patient, how many patients we've operated on, whether we had any issues, whether any issues require immediate attention of our executive team, and tier daily huddles have become a true core of our day-to-day -day management uh, uh, of our worldwide footprint. And that includes all of our sites, including those in London, Abu Dhabi, Florida, Ohio, and the list goes on. So maybe a play off of that for, for both of you, or. or you decide how you want to answer it is, obviously essential workers in your line of work mean something different than others, right? In many cases, everybody needs to, to show up to provide patient care. It's hard to do it remotely or on, on, on FaceTime. So I'm kind of curious the, how you gain momentum of getting the buy-in of the teams, traction across the organization with essential workers. Just what, what are some of the hurdles you faced? And, 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 and you mentioned some of the systems and tools, but what are some of the things that you've, you've focused on? I think for you know, taking good care of uh, our folks is essential. Uh, it is the loyalty to the organization is a key. At Cleveland Clinic, just like at GE, most of us are lifers. I'll never forget, I, one of my first assignments when as a CEO was to recognize people who, were, uh, who provided great service to the organization. At the time, I was 54 years old. And the first person that I should have recognized worked at the Cleveland Clinic for 55 years. So I said, what am I going to do now? <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, you were at the Cleveland Clinic before I was even in the plans. So, uh, you know, thank you very much. So uh, taking care of our, our folks is really, really important. And we have, uh, 
we have a simple framework that we've established, an ethical framework and behavioral framework for everything that we do. And Dara spoke about do the right thing. We have, we have kind of expanded it in a very simple terms. We say, please take care of one another as a family, take care of our patients as family members, and take care of Cleveland Clinic as your home. So no matter how complex a problem may appear, whenever people walk into my office or uh, in any office in the organization, I always ask them to say questions. How would you solve this problem if the person in question were a family member or if this place was really your own? So that's how we kind of take care of one another. And uh, through COVID and all the challenges, we, despite all the pressures that we had, we really put a lot, a lot of effort through our caregiver office to, to take care of everyone, everyone there. So that is really, really important and, and dear to our hearts. Another thing I would add is that what we've seen is that the actual ability to make things better for your teammates, for your patients, that experience is actually transformative. And that wasn't something I expected. I knew we'd be respecting the worker and I expected we would be making things better for patients. But I really didn't expect the tremendous transformation that an individual has when they suddenly realize that they have the ability to change their work, the experience of care for our patients. And that very much drives this desire to do it again, to do it again, and to do it again. I had the experience of working with one of our teams that delivers supplies to the operating room. It's essential work. You can't do it remotely. It's a pretty entry-level job in our organization. And uh, we've been working with them for a while. And of course, at first, there was some skepticism. There, there always is. But in time, they got more and more excited as they saw how they were able to improve their work. And other teams started coming to them to ask how to do 5S in their workspace or improve their process. And one actually got a caregiver award for being willing to help another team improve their work. And I went down to visit them with one of our physician leaders, Bob Wiley, and he was asking them uh, what was different now? Why were they able to deliver so much better now? And they'd solved these problems that they had faced so long. And I remember very clearly one of the caregivers, her name was Deb, she said, Dr. Wiley, we've always had it in us. You've unleashed it. <laughs> it it's there. We're just unleashing it. We're giving them a few concepts to make it easier for them to do what they always wanted to do in the first place. And it sounds like you guys do a great job of creating a flywheel effect of sharing ideas throughout the clinic in different areas, which is infectious and catches on for best practice sharing. Just maybe in our final minutes for each of you, kind of we started out with getting comfortable with uncomfortable problems. And in the spirit of we're all here to learn from each other, if you were to give us some advice each of one concrete thing that you think we ought to each take back that could to our work of different areas that would help us improve. What, what, would, you, what would you share with us? I would uh, stick to the process of tiered daily huddles that I just described and just would expand a little bit. Tiered daily huddles when teams at every tier of the organization get together in a structured way, talk about the, their daily work and what's ahead of them and what's important is really, really important. The uh, temptation is at the executive level to say, well, why do we need to get 20,000 people through this process every single day? You can get the data digitally. And the purpose of all of this is not so much that we learn how many surgeries we've done this day. The purpose of this entire process is to mobilize the entire organization around the things that matter for, pay, in this case, for patient care or for your business. Of course, we can get the data digitally, but that would defeat the purpose. The other reason why this is important is because you can then lay on top of it, once you establish that cadence and that becomes, so to say, your engagement tool, becomes your operational tool. You can layer on top of it whatever you think is a challenge for your large organization for any given period of time. For example, we had COVID, so we were measuring for a certain number of times how many patients we have with COVID, how many caregivers we had COVID. 
Then there was a staffing problem. So at a certain period of time, we didn't know whether we have enough beds to take care of patients. And once those problems were solved, we removed them from that framework. But you have a framework that you can use for any and every problem in the organization, and not just by dictating, but engaging tens of thousands of people in a, in a really constructive way every single day. So if I were to say one thing that has transformed the way that we go about our business would be tier daily huddles. Please remember the last word on your advice for, for all of us. Yeah, don't, don't ever process it. I talk to teams and leaders who want to take six months to design their tier daily huddle system. Don't make it better in a meeting room with a plan. Make it better by practicing it. Schedule your 15 minutes for tomorrow, today, and shift the, the statement that we want you to embrace problems as opportunities to a reality. And I want to talk about them tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock for 15 minutes. And we're going to talk about how things are going and what's working well and what's getting in the way. Make it very real and practical, and then continuously improve it. Don't wait for it to be perfect, because it's never going to be. You have to practice to really make it effective and work for your organization. Tom and Lisa, thank you very, very much for a great conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.